blessed to be in the presence of the Lord today. Amen. Amongst all of God's people. Amen. Things are starting to um, change. God is blessing. God's doing some many wonderful things. God is doing some wonderful things and I miss. It's a lot of, um, wish I could tell you now, I'm wait till everything is settled and everything is done, but, but God's doing it. I just want to tell you that. Amen. Good to see everybody in church. Praise God. I think some of y'all already know, but some people don't. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I'll, I'll formally announce it when, when it's a done deal, when everything is done, but, but God is really on the move. Amen. I just want to encourage everybody to be faithful in what we're doing as a church and be faithful in our giving, our faithful in everything, because, because God's doing great things. Amen. Amen. We're, we're getting ready to blow up. <laughs> anyway, praise God. But it's just good. I don't want to do this thing. But it's, it's just good to be in God's presence today. And, um, I was encouraged. And you know, sometimes when you go through things, you, you see a bunch of things, you feel down. But then every once in a while, there's something that just gives you this immediate encouragement. There was a video that um, I think Nessie sent about the, the Riverside County Sheriff. Did somebody else see that? And he made an announcement about certain things, and he said certain things, but basically in a nutshell, he said that, hey, I know they want to do all this kind of stuff, but, <laughs> but we're not enforcing that. Because people have the responsibility. You have a responsibility to protect yourself. Amen. Amen. And I just want to encourage everybody, if you're here, and you, um, and if you, if you can, if, you know, wear, wear your mask. I want to encourage everybody to do that. Because a lot of times it's not for you, it's for other people. Amen. You may not have it, but you, somebody else may, and you may, or if you do have it, don't know it, you can give it to somebody else. I just want to encourage everybody if you, if you can. And um, I always have a thing about when people say, oh, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. I, you can do what you want. Nobody can make you do anything. But if it's something that's going to help somebody else protect, why not? Amen. We can't be so, so staunch about what we want to do that we, don't, we fail to see others. Amen. We have to be, be good about that. All right, so we're going to re return back to our series where we've been talking about success in life or principles to live by. Amen. This is um, something that we want to go into as we're going into this new year and this, this new season as a church. We're getting ready to go into a new season. Amen. So 2020, uh, 2020 was bad for, you know, for a lot of people, and it was a lot of things that we went through, but, but guess what? God is great. Amen. Amen. And, um, forget the past. We're getting ready to go into a new year, and then Again, as a church, God's, going, God's getting ready to elevate us. He's getting ready to put us on a pedestal, and, and, and we're going to be a beacon. Amen. We're going to be that lighthouse in the community that God wants us to be. But so, so just, just stay in prayer about everything. And again, I'll make a formal announcement when we can, but you know, I'm just waiting on everything to be finalized. But, but God is good. Amen. All right, success in life are principles to live by. So to have success in life, you have to live by certain principles. Amen. And when you live by certain principles, you will have success in life. All right, so these things are evident. So I want to talk today about spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline. Um, going into this new year, um, we did it a couple years ago. We did the Daniel fast. Some of y'all here when we did that? I think that's a blessing for us to do this year also. Amen. And um, before we do it, I'll actually teach, teach on it and, and different things because it's not what people think it was. Amen. Sometimes people, well, I'm on a Daniel fast. I'm just not eating meat, but I'm going to eat all the ice cream and, and, and all this other stuff. No, that's not what it was. Amen. But I'll, I'll, I'll teach you on this stuff. But we want to go into that. So we're talking about spiritual disciplines. Um, I remember in seminary, that was a book that we had to read. It was by, um, by Richard Taylor, and it was called The Disciplined Life. It was, a, it was a good read. If you can, pick it up and read it. it, it it'll be a blessing to you. It talks about how, um, as a Christian, you have to be disciplined. Amen. The word disciple in itself is from the word discipline. Amen. The disciplined ones. If you're a disciple of Christ, you should have some spiritual disciplines in your life. Now, when you have spiritual disciplines in your life, there's some things that you have convictions about. Amen. Now, um, I'm going to go into those in a minute, but before we start, let's, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God today. We thank you for, for this church. We thank you for each believer that's a part of this body. We just pray, God, that you would give us the ability to do what you called us to do as a church and as individuals also. We pray, God, that your word goes forth today, that it um, finds a lodging place in each heart, that you would strengthen us, God, and that you would help us to go into this new season as a church so we can reach our community. 
Once again, we appreciate what you're doing in our midst. God, we appreciate every believer, God. We pray for those who are not here that are um, maybe sick or shut in or, or just don't feel comfortable with coming out yet, God. We just pray for your encouragement um, in their lives and in their hearts that you can strengthen them, God. And um, let them know, God, that you're the author and finisher of our faith. God, you're the one that protects us. Amen. Even as you protected Israel from the death angel, God, you protect us from this, from this plague that we're facing as a world today. God, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for the hedge, God, of protection around us as a church, as a body, as individuals. And we pray that your hedge of protection can continue to be around us and strengthen us and allow us to be what you call called us to be. Once again, we thank you for the word today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, spiritual disciplines. All right, so as a spiritually disciplined person, there are convictions that you need to have. Now, when you think about convictions, there's, um, if you can give conv the word conviction a definition, it's, um, I would say it would be things that you do or that you don't do, <laughs> amen, no matter what the cost or the circumstances, amen. Things that you do or things that you refuse to do, no matter what the cost or the circumstances. Now, a lot of times in the day and age we live in, people really don't have convictions. They, they kind of change with the weather. Um, they kind of change with who they're around. You may have a, think you have a conviction about something, but when you're around certain people and that changes you, that's really not a conviction. That's a preference. Amen. Sometimes Christians have preferences instead of convictions. Now, there are three things um, I want to share about convictions that are, that are very powerful that, that you need to know about convictions. Now, a conviction is visible, first of all. A conviction is visible. So that means when you, when you have a conviction about something, it should be seen. Amen? Um, I'm not going to do this, so you don't do it. Or I'm not going to drink, but you park in front of the liquor store. That's not seen. Amen? Amen. Well, I just parked there. To, no, no, no. That's a conviction. When you have a conviction about certain things, you don't do them. So when you have that conviction, these things should be visible. Amen? Another thing about conviction, a conviction should be constant. It should be constant, meaning that you do the same thing over and over and over again. Amen. If you have a conviction about going to church, you should always be in church. It's a wonderful testimony to have a conviction. I know last week, um, Mike and Shauna, they weren't in church. And, and um, because they, they're faithful in church, I was wondering what was wrong. And, um, and there was something wrong. Shauna was sick. So the thing is, is that when you have a conviction about something, it's constant. You don't change with the weather. You continue to hold on to your conviction no matter what happens, no matter who's watching, no matter what's going on. Right. Amen. Another thing about conviction, your, convi your conviction should be consistent. Um, if you have a conviction of, of tithing, you shouldn't tithe when you had the money and say, forget it. I didn't have God understands I didn't have the money. No, it's, it should be consistent. You do it all the time. Amen. It shouldn't be something that on and off or whatever. I know some, one, one time I watched this, um, this video about this guy. He said he had a conviction about, um, about being a vegetarian. You know, that's, that's happening now. A lot of people are vegans and all that kind of stuff. Um, but people have that um, conviction, well, I'm not going to eat meat. But he went somewhere and he smelled them ribs and it was over. <laughs> His convictions went out the window. So that's not a consistent conviction. Amen. Amen. Like people when they say they're not going to eat, I'm not going to eat pork or whatever, but that sausage sure was smelling good. That bacon, I couldn't help myself. You can help yourself. Amen. A conviction should be something that's consistent. And people different, say different things about their conviction in, in, in their, um, in their, I'm not disciplined, preacher. I'm not disciplined. You, it, it's up to you. It's, up, it's what you want to do. Um, I like sweets. I love sweets. I, it's, 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 it's hard for me to not eat sweets. Amen. But I can, I can do it. So sometimes people say, well, I have convictions about certain things, and, and I just can't. Just think about something that you love a lot. And just think about myself. If I was getting ready to eat this piece of um, pecan pie, man, I love pecan pie. That's one of my favorites. Amen. It's sweet. It'll, it'll put you in, in a diabetic coma, but it, I love it. Amen. But, um, but if, some, if I had a pecan, piece of pecan pie and it was hot, you know how when it's hot and it's Oh, man, that's when I love the most. But it's hot, and, and you put that ice cream on top, and it, oh, man. I don't even want to think about it no more. Amen. And then me, I like to get a scoop of peanut butter. Amen. I'm like a rat. I love peanut butter. But anyway, it's, it's there, and, and I'm getting ready to take a bite, and, 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 and I can't help myself. People say they can't help themselves. But if somebody was behind me with a gun and say, put the, the pie, I would. So that just goes to show you that 
if the, the right circumstance is produced and you're in the right place at the right time, you can say no to almost anything. Ain't it? Sometimes people say, well, I can't say no to that. No, yeah, you can. <laughs> if it was the right circumstance, the right time. So, but the thing is, you need to learn how to have spiritual conviction. You need to learn how to have your own convictions. It shouldn't be that everything is forced upon you. When you're a child of God, everything shouldn't be forced upon you. You should do things because you love God. And as a child of God, you understand that um, in the Old Testament, how things work. Everything was forced. God made them do certain things. And when they didn't do it, they were punished for it. Amen. But now you do things because you love God. Amen. God isn't making you do certain things. You do it because you love him. Amen. And when you're in church, you're in church because you love God. You love the word of God. You love the scriptures. You love being around the fellowship of the brothers and the sisters. There's something about that camaraderie. There's something about that fellowship. There's something about that closeness that should bring a conviction when you're a child of God. You love being around your family. If you love your kids, you love your wife, you want to be around them. Amen. We're family. Amen. As a child of God, you're family. You have an extended family of believers. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, when you're a Christian and there's people in your family that aren't, God looks at the church uh, body and family closer, and he looks at that as your real family instead of the people that you just live with and they're not, uh, they're not converted. That's something that's hard for people to believe. But Jesus said, hey, my sheep know my voice, and they won't hear another. Amen. He said to all the Pharisees at certain places at certain times that you're of your father the devil. So in other words, there's some people that have God for their father and some people that have the enemy for their father. So you should have certain spiritual convictions in your life. Amen. There are six convictions I want to go over today. I don't want to keep you guys long. Um, I know I've been a little bit long when I'm trying to convince some of the message. That's why last week I cut one in half or whatever and we did one half. But I'm going to try to finish this one. Amen. So six spiritual convictions that people that are disciplined should have. And again, I'm not telling you this so you can turn around and make your, your convictions because I said it. Now, the Bible is very clear that to whom much is given, much is required. Y'all already know that. So there's certain things that God may require of me that he won't require of you. And I'm not going to try to force that upon you. You have to grow. Amen. The Bible tells us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And as you grow in God, God puts more responsibilities upon you. If you're still in the same place and you haven't grown, you haven't done anything else, God hasn't put any convictions on you, then you might not be growing. It's time to evaluate your relationship with God. And that's the Holy Spirit's job. It's not my job to force my convictions on you, and I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to preach to you what the word says. I'm going to say some certain things that a Christian should have. There's, some, there's certain things you should have as a Christian. Just like um, a tree should have leaves, unless it's a palm tree. And it has those long, wavy things. Amen. Amen. There's certain things you should have. A cat should have fur, unless it's a hairless cat. Amen. A dog should bark, because he's a dog. And as a Christian, there's certain things that you should do. And that's not no kind of, you know, space, space cadet stuff. God expects you to do certain things when you're his child. Amen. So, and as you grow in God, God will place more convictions on you. I know, for me, there's certain things that I can't do. Not only because I'm a pastor, but the Holy Spirit puts convictions on me. Like, one thing I used to do when I was um, wasn't saved, I could go in the store and I would be looking at something on the rack and it would fall. And i just keep on moving. I can't do that now. I have to pick it up. The Holy Spirit deals with me about that. And not only do I pick that up, he'll deal with me to pick up everything else. That's me. I don't know, I don't know about you, but that's the conviction that I have. Like back in the days when I wasn't saved, I would ride down, I'd roll my window down and throw trash out the room. I can't do that now. The Holy Spirit deals with me about that, not to do that. Certain things I just can't do. Now, if you do it, that's fine. But I can't do certain things. Amen. All right, so six convictions that, um, that, that a, a disciplined person or a disciple of Christ need to have. Amen. So a spiritual, spiritually disciplined pers person should, number one, have the Bible as their source of direction for their life. If you're a spiritually disciplined person and this is a conviction that you should have, the Bible should be the source of direction for your life. Not Oprah. Amen. 
And it bothers me how people that are Christians take these people that are in the world, they take their advice on things that they're not even good at. Now, let me tell you this. God, you're not going to be good at everything. You have to understand it. And that's okay. It's a problem when people aren't good at certain things and they try to make you think that they're good at everything. That's a lie. No person is good at everything. And we have to know that. And that's all right. Amen. In the church, I realize there's some things that I'm not good at. I'm not good at decorating. Everything will be a certain color. Everything will be a certain way. Gray is a color I like. Everything will be gray. <laughs> so I, I step out of that area. I don't let, you know, even in the house, I don't try to decorate the house. That's my wife's thing. I, I don't step into that. I stay in my lane. <laughs> Amen. So as a Christian, you learn how to stay in your lane. You're not good at everything. Well, preacher, I want to sing. I want to get up behind the pulpit and sing. You may not be able to sing. And that's okay. It's sad when people don't have a gift and they think they have one, and then they get embarrassed. Like on the American Idol thing, when people get up there and they get up there and make a fool of themselves. and, and Well, they always told me I could sing. Well, they lied to you, honey, because you can't. That's why I'm not going to try to sing. I know that these singing preachers get up there and, oh, I can't sing, so I'm not going to try it. Amen. I stay in my lane. Amen? All right, so the Bible needs to be the source of direction for your life. Not Oprah, not Dr. Phil. Even Steve Harvey. It bothers me when they sell, show clips of Steve Harvey. I guess he has a television show. And he gives people marital advice. This dude's been divorced three times. Why would you take advice from him? I don't understand that. But people stand up, Steve, can you tell me how to? He can't tell you because he don't know how to do it himself. Now, I'm not dogging a man out. Hey, Amen. he's successful. He's done a lot in life. He's a good guy and all these kind of things. But marital advice, you shouldn't seek that from him. Just like if you're getting ready to get married and your single friend is trying to pick apart your, your prospective fiancé, why are you taking their advice? That reason is, there's a reason why they're single. Amen? And I don't, I'm not trying to trip on single people. You should be selective of who you marry. Amen? Because marriage is a commitment that you take on for life. Be selective. Take your time. The sad thing about it, Pete, is people take more time in buying a new car than they do from choosing a man. Man, they'll research the car and look into the car. What about this? What about that? And, and what did this person? But somebody marry? Oh, they look good. I'm going to marry them. No. <laughs> Amen. So the Bible should be the source of direction for your life. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14. I'm sorry, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture. It kills me when some people say that, uh, well, man wrote the Bible. And they're in all these different types of religions. Man wrote the Bible, and uh, therefore the Bible is not correct. You're a lie too. You know the first few books of the Bible were written by Moses? Moses wasn't there when God created everything. So how did he know what to write? But I don't know a religion that does not hold the Torah in high esteem. I don't know any religion. Moses is one of the most respected people of, 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 Christian, of, 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 of all religions. Everybody quotes Moses. They quote what he does. They talk about his, his journey from Egypt to, uh, to the promised land. They talk about all these things. But Moses wrote the first few books of the Bible, and, and nobody questions that. But they want to question the Apostle Paul. The Bible said that all scripture is given by God's inspiration. All scripture. Amen. John chapter 17, verses 17 and 18. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. And you sent me into the world that I have sent them. I'm sorry. I also have sent them into the world. Amen. The word of God is truth. Jesus was saying this when he was praying for his disciples. God's word is truth. You have to understand that. Stop taking every 
everybody's advice, learn how to take the word of God. Amen? Use that for your guide. Use that for your lamp. Always go to God's word first. Stop going to everybody else. And let me tell you something about the word of God. The answer is in there. The problem is, um, I mean, if people have not read the whole Bible, they don't know certain things that are in the Bible. It will amaze you what's in the Bible. The first time I picked up the word of God and read it from cover to cover, I used to always, my mind would always be blown. Man, that's in the Bible? Everything's in there. It's your instructions for this planet, what you need to do, the way you need to live. Learn how to go to the word of God and consult the Bible, not everybody else. If you were script scripturally sound and biblically um, um, literate, you would be able to go to ch a church immediately and point out the issues and the problems or the things that they do that are not according to the word of God. Galatians chapter 5. I just want to read this because um, it's, it's a good part, part to, um, to know. You need to know this. Amen. And um, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It tells you what the fruit of the Spirit is. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, which is also discipline. And it says that against such there is no law. Now, there's people that will tell you that the fruit of the Spirit is... Churches 
not, the music is like it. It's bass heavy. Amen. If you go to a, a predominantly Caucasian church, they have a lot of guitar and, and, and different things. So the, the, and, and that's not, it's nothing wrong with that. When you go to other places, like Haiti, you go to Haiti, they have a, a compa beat in the churches. If you go to Africa, I'm sure they have a certain type of beat in the churches. These, these are things that there's nothing wrong with that. So stop being so stinking self-righteous. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and get out of the box and, and, and expand your thinking because God is a big God. All right. So the Bible should be the source of direction for your life when you have certain spiritual convictions and when you're spiritually, dis spiritually disciplined. All right, number two, talking about the convictions of the spiritually disciplined. Number two, my money must be made and spent by Christian principles. My money must be made and spent by Christian principles. Um, years ago, I was listening to a radio show, and I know some of y'all probably heard of Dave Ramsey, right? He's a financial guy, and everything he talks about is based on biblical principles. And a guy called Dave Ramsey, and he was asking questions like, how should I do this? And he lived somewhere in, in the Bay Area, and this guy was 22 years old, and he said, well, Dave, I'm getting ready to buy a house, a condo, and, and it's overlooking the beach, and he was explaining the condo and all of these kind of things, and he had a, had a long explanation and, and Dave Ramsey said, well, you don't need to, to go, go do that. You're young. You, he said, but I'm going to pay cash for it. He said, how in the world? He said, I just want to ask you this. How in the world? And what I love so much about you, he's a brother too, man. I was like, here you go, come on. But anyway, he said, how in the world do you have a um, million dollars to spend on the condominium and you're 20, 20, um, two years old? How did you do that? And the guy started telling the story. What happened was someone in his family died and they left him an inheritance. And, and the guy said, I'm a Christian, I go to church, and I've been walking with God for many years. And he said, I prayed about what to do with the money. And he said there was this new up-and-coming um, business called Google. <laughs> and he said, God put it on my heart to invest everything I had in Google. And this guy's 22 years old and he's a multimillionaire. He said, that's how I made the money. So you need to learn how to make your money, spend your money on Christian principles. You don't go out there and sell drugs in the name of the Lord and they come in and no, you don't do that. That's not Christian principles. Amen? <laughs> Amen. You don't cheat the government from taxes and do all that and say, hey, I'm a, no, that, that's not Christian principles. Amen? Do the right thing. Remember this about giving. Giving is an opportunity. We have the blessing to give to God's program. Amen. Think about this. Everything else you give to on earth is going to stay here. When you give to God's program, there's a reward for it in heaven. What if God, this, this, this is hyper-thinking, what, what if God um, gave us money equivalent to what we gave on earth when we get to heaven? Or, or he had your mansion and all that structured how you, you didn't get in my program, so you got a little shed over there in the corner. <laughs> hey there's nothing else you can give to that's going to follow you for eternity and again I'm not saying this because sometimes people think and they, that's always what you hear oh the church wants my money and all that kind of stuff no the church is trying to tell you how to be blessed now that's not a problem when people have ten dollars and they give a dollar to the church that's not a problem oh yeah I give a dollar to the church they don't miss that they oh that's no big deal but then when it gets to hundred dollars and you give ten that's when they oh that's still not a big deal. When you get to a thousand and then you got to give a hundred, that's when people, oh, wait a minute. They in my pocket now. <laughs> but the thing is, the principle hasn't changed. And that's one thing I love about God. God made it to where everybody could give because it was a percentage. Amen. And again, that's just the baseline. That's, no, that's not something that you, you have to give a certain percentage. It's not. And I'm not on that, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you how to be blessed. Amen. Amen. Sometimes people don't like when they, they hear how they need to succeed. They want to, but they'll, they'll take something crazy and they'll swallow that hook, line, and sinker. But when you tell them a basic principle, oh, that's too hard. But you can go to some financial seminar, pay this dude $1,000 so he can tell you how to make money, but you won't just go by the Christian principles. 
Because people want everything quick. That's one thing about God. God is not the, the, the a microwave. You have to wait on certain things. Amen? Because when you wait on it, you're ready for it. God's not going to give you nothing that's going to destroy you. I remember when I was a kid and I was, um, we got, it was 4th of July, we had these fireworks. And, um, and my uncle and them told me to leave the fireworks alone. I'm like, everybody else playing, bro. And like, all right, whatever. And then they went in the house. So I'm like, okay, now, now is my chance. And I got one of them things and lit it, man, and didn't throw it in time. It blew up in my hand. And, they told me I wasn't ready for it. There's <laughs> certain things you're not ready for. And God knows that. So that's why sometimes you have to wait on certain things in God. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. My money should be made and my money should be spent by Christian principles. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will be put into your bosom. But with the same measure that you meet, it shall be measured back to you. Now, that's hard for some people to swallow. So in other words, how you give, that's how you're going to receive. You think about the principle of planting. When you plant a few different um, seeds, don't expect a big acre of, of what you planted. It's not going to happen. Amen? If you plant corn, don't expect watermelons to grow. They're not going to grow. I don't care how much you pray and how much you fast and how much you, oh, God, you can pray over this. you still going to get corn. Amen. And people need to understand that about giving. When you give, that's, it's okay that you can give your time. That's, that's a blessing. You know, that's needed. There's certain things that are needed. But you have to be balanced. Amen. Amen. So learn the principle of giving. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Now Jesus sat opposite of the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which was a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say that this poor widow has put more in than all those who have given into the treasury. For they put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all of her whole livelihood. Now there's a few different things in this. First of all, Jesus was paying attention to what people were giving. You think God don't pay attention to what you give? He does. Amen? And when you ask him for something, what if he said, well, you don't get in my program, so why should I do this for you? Amen. I'm, I can tell you story after story, time after time, thing after thing that I've seen where people who are faithful to God's program, God just made miracles happen. And then pay for their little tithe over and over again a hundredfold. I can tell you story after story. It's, it's amazing what God can do for those who are faithful to him. Amen. Amen. So when you, people look for this quick scheme. I want to get rich quick. So let me go to the casino, put everything on black. And hopefully God, God I'll give to the church. No, man. Or I'm going to buy these lotto tickets. With nothing, I hope you win. Amen. Give, give something to the church. But, but don't look for that. Amen? Preacher, do you play, play the lotto? I don't. So, hmm. I'd rather buy a candy bar or something. But like I said, if you win, don't forget us. Amen? <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. All right. All right, the third principle. Amen. We talk about six convention, convictions of spiritual discipline. Number three, my body belongs to God. When a person has spiritual convictions, they need to understand that your body and your body belongs to God. Now, I was thinking about that when I was riding to um, riding church. I saw this car. This car was sputtering on the road. It wasn't, it wasn't driving good. Now, there was one of a few things that was wrong with it. He could have had some, some kind of engine or mechanical failure, or he could have put the wrong fuel in it, or bad fuel. I'm going to tell you something about our our code is, it, to fuel is hard. In the military, I was a petroleum supply specialist. I know how to test fuel. I can work on a pipeline. There's all kinds of stuff I can do with fuel. I'm going to tell you something about Arco fuel. It will destroy your car. Well, preach is cheap. You're going to need to pay now, or you're going to pay later. 
And it don't even last that long. Do this experiment. If you buy Arco fuel, do this experiment. Put Arco fuel in your, in your tank, fill it up. Watch the mileage. Keep track of the mileage. See what you get. Go to Chevron, buy Chevron fuel, record the mileage, and see what you get after a tank of gas. And you tell me what, what was better. I used to test fuel in the military. That's what I did. Amen? A, 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 um, an aircraft couldn't take off if we didn't test that fuel a lot. Because if you have any percentage of water, guess what's going to happen to the aircraft? It's going to crash. And they're going to come back to the guy who did the fuel. Hey, what's the problem? That Black Hawk went down. You put bad fuel in it. So we had to make sure everything was on point. So the thing is, is that you can either pay now or pay later. But your body is the same way. One of the, 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 um, the best things I heard about nutrition was a guy that said this. He said, um, your body's just like a car. If you put bad fuel in it, it's not going to run properly. I know fried chicken tastes good. Trust me, I know it. I know barbecue ribs good. I know bacon's good. And bacon grease, I told you about that a couple weeks ago. I know all that stuff is great, but it's not good for you. And it'll make your body run hard. Amen? Your body belongs to God. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promises, I'm sorry, having promise of the life that is now is, and that which which is to come. Now the reason I put this in, because sometimes I meet Christians, and they, especially, you know, preaching and stuff, and they always try to quote that scripture. You know, hey man, you doing all that kind of stuff. You don't need that. Bodily exercise profited little. It may profit little, but it has a profit. <laughs> it didn't say it don't have no profit. You should take care of your body. And the sad thing about it is, I've seen so many Christians stop what God can do in their life because they're they're not um, they're not happy. They're not. And I'm not, and I'm not sitting there preaching. No, I, did y'all know? Some of y'all knew when I was two seventy. I lost a lot of weight because I realized something. First of all, the doctor gave me some, some news and they said either you fix this or some people would rather just be, be, be sick and jacked up, which is crazy to me. You don't want to change your diet. I don't know, but anyway. But um, your body belongs to God. Amen. You need to make sure you take care of it. You only get one in this world. And you can't say that it's God's fault if you don't take care of your it's a straight up fact that a lot of issues that people have is because of their diet and because of the way they take care of their body. It's a, it's a fact. The spiritual, you know, in the Old Testament, God gave people spiritual um, guidelines of what to eat. That's why I can tell you this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, and God's not wrong. When he told people, I know one guy said, well, God made the Bible and he told people to eat uh, plants and all that kind of stuff. That was your food. And if you don't do that, you're outside of the word of God. I said, you're a lie to me. Because when God told the priests to slay those animals, what did he say that they needed to do with the meat? Throw it in the trash? He said, you roast it with fire and you eat it. The Bible is not wrong. Amen? He didn't say you eat it every day. He didn't say you fry it in uh, 3,000 pounds of lard. He didn't say you do all that. But he told you you could eat it. Amen? So uh, you can believe what you want. I always say this. I believe God's word. So you can't make it say something that it don't say. But the thing is, everybody else is sitting there listening to that. They're like, yeah, preacher, yeah, preacher. But I know the Bible. I'm like, you a lie to me. <laughs> anyway, Amen. All right, so your body belongs to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. God don't just care about your spirit. He cares about your body too. The Bible tells you to glorify God in these ways. Amen. So you realize something that your body belongs to God. I remember years ago there was a, um, a sister that I knew. She went to a certain church and we used to fellowship there. Wonderful lady, man. Loved God. 
was bringing, always bringing somebody to church, always kept getting people saved and, and doing all these kind of things. And, and, and she wound up dying prematurely because of cirrhosis of the liver. And she said, it's because I used to, when I was young, I used to drink all kind of tequila. And, and, and I, every time you look around, I couldn't stop drinking. But I got saved. Amen. Sometimes God can reverse them things. Sometimes he won't. Because you have a choice. Amen? Amen. And I'm not trying to beat y'all down with, with, with guidelines for eating and all that kind of stuff. But realize something that your body belongs to God. Amen? You can bring glory to God by doing the right thing and taking care of your body. Amen. You know, that's one of the blessings that the, the scriptures told us. He said that, um, <clears throat> I want you to be in good health yeah. and prosper. Yeah. It's not wrong for you to have good health. It's not wrong for you to prosper. Just like you, God wants your soul to prosper, correct? So he wants you to prosper financially, and he wants you to be in good health. It's not God's will for you to die sick and hurt and barely can move. It's not God's will for you to do that. It's God's will for you to be 60, 70 years old, still exercising, still can get around, walking good, being able to see your grandkids, being able to see, uh, doing all these different things. That's God's will for your life. You know what the Bible said when Moses died and he was just like he was when he was a youth? His eyesight didn't dim. Now that was supernatural. Now that wasn't no. To be able to walk up and down that mountain at over 100 years old, man, that's God is right there. Because I probably can't do it now. I can walk down the street and I'm like, <laughs> amen. But we have to make sure we take care of our body. Amen? All right. Your body belongs to God. Another um, conviction of the spiritually disciplined, uh, number four, is when they make a commitment, they see it through. When they make a commitment, they see it through. And I keep telling people this. One of the marks of the end times is that people will be covenant breakers. They won't keep their word. They'll say they're going to do something and won't do it. They'll promise you, I'm going to do this, preacher. I'm going to do that. Or, or I'm going to do this. And I give you my word. And they don't deliver. It said that's one going to be one of the marks of the, um, of the end times. People are going to be like that. Amen. And we live in a society where people are like that. They make promises to you and lie to you. Look you right in the eyes, right in the eyes. It's like they try to do it. Let me look you right in the eyes and lie to you. <laughs> that's not God's will. Amen. When you're spiritually disciplined, you realize something, that my word, people are resting upon my word. I need to do the right thing. You know, there used to be a time in, in, in America where you could shake your hand, somebody's hand, and you could look them in the eye and say, hey, they would make land deals like that. Because a man's word was everything. If you didn't have your word, you didn't have anything. But now, you can just look for somebody to be jacked up and lie to you. One of the things I always tell people, I say, hey, it's not that I don't trust you. I just want to verify. Amen? Okay. <laughs> I hear you, but I just got to check. So when you make a commitment, you see it through. You know, when I was a kid, um, my dad liked baseball. And my, my, my grandfather was a, a baseball scout. He discovered um, raw talent. And he was one of the founders. He was instrumental, instrumental in the Negro League of Baseball being started. My granddad was. And um, he discovered, again, several. So they wanted me to play baseball. I got out there, my dad went, and, and he asked me, did I want to play? I was like, sure, dad, I want to play. Okay. So he went to the store and bought gloves and bats and balls and all that kind of stuff. And man, I was out there one time, the ball was in there, and I was getting ready to catch it, and I couldn't see it. The sun was right in my eyes, and it hit me right in the head. Bang! I threw all that junk down. I said, man, I quit this, man. <laughs> you know what my dad told me? He said, I bought gloves, I bought balls, I bought all this, and I paid for you to play. You're going to finish the season. Nowadays, people don't do that with their children. It's okay, baby. You don't have to do that. That mean old coach made you do. You, you're teaching them something, whether you know it or not. And they're the first ones to quote, oh, train up a child in the way they should go. What you're training them to do is to be a quitter. When things get hard in life, just quit. When the marriage gets rocky, just quit. When they don't do what you want them to do on the job, all you got to do is quit. When the money's not right, just quit. Yeah, you signed the lease for three years, oh, just walk away and quit. What you're training them to do is to be a quitter. We don't understand that. You train your 
not what you say. Oh, son, don't smoke cigarettes. Yeah, they're bad for you. Yeah, they'll kill you. That What's the first thing they're going to want to do? Smoke cigarettes. So whether you know it or not, you're training them. So as a child of God, you need to make sure you do things and you don't quit. When you start something, finish it. There was no way I was going to stand before a congregation of people and put a ring on my wife's finger and say, I vow this and all that kind of stuff. Because first of all, you do that before God. That's why you get married in a church. That's why there's a preacher or a justice of the peace because you're making vows. It's a legal binding document. Do you know that? You give your word. And when you walk out on that, now don't get me wrong, I'm not sitting here trying to duck because things happen in life. And it may not be you, it may be them. Oh, forget that joke, I'm leaving. Well, well, you have, then you're free to marry somebody else according to the Bible. But because it's breath stank, that's not a biblical right for a divorce. He used to hide it with men before y'all got together, so hide it with men now. Get up in the morning, run to the bathroom, brush your teeth. Good morning, honey. Amen. Hey, but you made that vow. Amen. Now, I'm going to take some time on this because this is important and it illustrates what I want to say. It's, it's um, lengthy reading. But it's from Jephthah. You know, Jephthah was one of the judges in Scripture. And Jephthah made a covenant with God. He wanted victory over his enemies. He said, God, I want you to give me victory. So he said he was going to do something. So let's read it. Um, Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 32. Now Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hand, then I will be, I'm sorry, it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace and from the people of Ammon, surely, I'm sorry, shall surely be the Lord's. And I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. Now the first thing I want to say about this is don't make foolish vows that you're not going to keep. God probably wouldn't have given him victory anyway, but that was a vow that he made. All right, Judges chapter 11, verses 34 through 36. Now Jephthah came to his house in Mizpah. There was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, for you have brought me very low. You are among those who have troubled me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Now the last, I'm just kind of skipped over just so you can get the gist of it. You can go back and read it. Now Judges 11, chapter, um, Judges chapter 11, verses 39 through 40. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned to her father. And he carried out his vow with which he had vowed. She knew no man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went forth each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. So basically, in a nutshell, he had to kill his daughter because he told God he was going to do so. Now, I know preachers that have preached this and said, well, he didn't really kill her. He took her and let her serve. That's not what the Bible says. Just because you have this heart of love and compassion, that don't mean nothing. The scripture said that he made a vow that he would go sacrifice her. And he did that. You can't spin that. It's what the Bible said. So he made a vow that he was going to kill his daughter. God didn't ask him to do that. God didn't ask you to make certain vows that you make. Years ago, somebody that used to go to this church said something to me. They said, Pastor, I want you to do something for me. I'm getting ready to get a big settlement. I want you to pray that God will bless me with the settlement. And when I get the settlement, the settlement was something like $80,000. 
When I get it, the first thing I'm going to do is pay my tithe to the church, and I'm going to give the church a little bit more. I said, okay, sister, I'll pray. Guess what? She got the settlement, and she was gone. It's comical, but God wrote that down. People forget. God don't forget. And when you give God your word about something and you don't keep it, I'm telling you, you're playing with some dangerous ground. The same person wound up with cancer. Same person. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that God cursed her because of that, but I don't know, you make your own assumption. All of these other things start happening. Pray for me, pray for me. All I can keep thinking about is when you gave God your word about something and you didn't keep it. You got to be careful. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 7. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow, vow, and, and to vow, vow, and not pay it. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error or the preacher. I misspoke, preacher. No, you made a vow to God. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For the multitude of dreams and many words there is vanity, but fear God. It's better not to do it. It gets me nowadays. These people, these kids now, they have no idea what they're doing. The devil has propped them up to start saying. They start saying these foolish things. That's on God, I'm going to do this, and they don't do it. You better be careful. People play with God. They don't know what they're doing. You better shut your stinking mouth because God knows how to close it. And I know it's just, oh, it's cute and all that kind of stuff. That's not cute. And they say it all the time. That's on God. That's on, I'm going to do this. That's on God. And they don't do it. God has no pleasure in that. He calls you a fool when you do that. I'm telling you, you can play with people all you want to. You can play with the dog down the street. You can, you can play with toys. You can do all, But when you start playing with God, you're treading on some dangerous ground. We don't know the power that God has. We can only imagine. God is powerful. You know, in the Old Testament, they didn't even want to say God's name because they realized the power that God has. And now people just spew it and say it, and they don't think there's no consequences for this stuff. There's consequences for it. It's better off that you kept your mouth shut. And I hear him say it all the time. This on God. I'm like, you better shut up, really, because you don't know what you're doing. There was time in scripture where people said things and, and, and you, don't, you don't want God angry with you. And I'm going to tell you something about it. I preached a message years ago. I think some of you, I know Deacon Roberts was here and some of y'all were here. Um, that, what, what was the title of the message? Um, the same God or God hasn't changed. And it was about Noah and Ark. God hadn't changed. The same God that, that destroyed the whole world and wiped out every animal except the two by two and Noah and his family, the same God is still serving and still reigning in heaven. The same God when people talk trash about Moses and stood against him and say, we preachers too. They were. We're priests too. We can get a sacrifice too. Who are you that we should do that kind of stuff? The same God that allowed the earth to open up and swallow them people and they went down into hell alive. That's the same God that we serve today. The same God that when they were pursuing the children of Israel through that wilderness and they came to that Red Sea and they parted the water and he said, get to the other side. And he said, lift up your rod once again. And all the sea came and drowned everybody. It's the same God that we serve. People don't know. They say all these kind of things. They make these vows and they don't keep them. They don't realize something. That you're playing with fire. The Bible tells you that God is a consuming fire. And the same God that did it back then is the same God that we serve today. But on the flip side, the same God that caused cancer to be healed. The same 
Choose you this day who you're going to serve. God did that all through the scriptures. He said, divide them. Who are you going to serve? But everybody wanted to go with the, uh, the prophets of Baal because they had the nice garb on. Amen? They had the gold chains. They had all the music and they had all the flags. Uh, and here come Elijah with his old dirty clothes on. Uh, but he had God. Uh, and they all went up on a mountain. There 400 prophets uh, and it was only one of them. Uh, and Elijah said something. Uh, he said, if you're on the Lord's side, come over here. And they said, we'll see who God is. Uh, let me tell you something about God. When you're a servant of the Lord, God will prove not only to you, uh, but he'll prove to everybody around you uh, that you're a child of God. Uh, and guess what? The fire came down. Uh, consume the sacrifice uh, because God is a consuming fire. Don't play with God. It's better that you keep your mouth shut than you play with God. And people think just because you can't see God that he's not there. They think just because God don't speak out of heaven. He even said in the scripture, said, I'm not going to talk to another man face to face like I did with Moses. I'm not going to have a relationship with people anymore like I did with Moses. Because God talked to Moses face to face. God said, I'm not going to do that no more because people can't respect me. God is holy. God's watching, and he's watching everything. God's keeping a record. I'm telling you, when, I, when a Christian I know dies, I don't mourn for them. They've been going on to their reward. I'm going to tell you something, when I die, don't cry for me. You better have a party. Because I sure ain't going to, I may be crying for you. Oh, Lord, they're still on earth. They're still going through all the trials and tribulations. Lord, help them. Help them to get to where I am. I'm telling you, when I die, don't cry. And don't try to pray that I, get, I come back here either. Because I'm going to try to, I'm going to come looking for you. You're going to have to pray my strength in the Lord, nigga. I'm trying to. Yeah. If I'm on life support, don't keep me on that junk. Better turn that switch. Let me go. I don't want to be here longer than I have to be. And that's the thing. When you're a child of God, you're looking for something. There's a longing for you in your heart. You want to be with God. You want to be in heaven. Now, everything I've ever worked for, everything I've dreamed, it's been over 20 years, 24 years, and I've been walking with the Lord. My dream is to go to heaven. I have dreams about standing on the streets of gold. I have dreams about talking to Jesus. I don't want to be here forever. I'm not trying to make this world comfortable because I'm ready to go to heaven. One time a guy said something to me. He said, man, you, it's like you're living to die. I said, you're right. I said, you don't even get it, man. You're right, I am. Everything I'm doing in this life is in preparation for the life to come. Amen. So when you make a commitment to God, see it through. Years ago, my grandmother, man, my grandmother's gone on to be, be with the Lord. Now. She was 102 and she died. And she could still walk. She could still talk. She still had all her faculties. She was telling me stuff I did when I was a kid and all kinds of stuff. She remembered all of that. Amen. But um, she, was, she was always on her health. Always. But she told me a story about one time that she was in an airplane. She was coming to California, as a matter of fact, from Alabama. And she said that plane had the worst turbulence. She said it was everybody on the plane was crying and screaming and stuff because the thing felt like it was going to fall apart. And she said, when I was on that plane, I bowed my head and I said, God, if you allow this plane to land and allow me to live, I'll never get on another airplane as long as I live on this earth. <laughs> and guess what? God honored it. And every time something happened, Grandma, can you go fly? I can't do it, baby. I made a vow to the Lord. I can't do it. Unless we get in the car and drive or we get a bus ticket or something, I can't go. Because she made a vow. She didn't forget her vow. You didn't forget yours either. I just want to admonish people. If you made a vow to God and then keep, you need to go pray. Repent of that. Now from there you can move on. Because once you pray and forget, that's the thing. People don't understand something about repentance. When you repent, the Bible says that God cast that sin as far as from the east to the west. And we don't have the ability to do this as humans. 
but it said he remembers your past sins no more. If you don't pray for anything else but that, you need to be praying. So if you made a vow to the Lord and you can, after service or whatever, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't even wait. I pray right now, bow your head, or, or, or in your mind, God forgive me. Just make it right, amen? Make it right. Because you don't want to play with God. You want to make that, it, so just say, God, I made a mistake, I was wrong, I was foolish, and just, just lay it for what it is and repent. But don't do it again. Because he has no pleasure in fools. So when you make a commitment, see it through. Another conviction of spiritually, dis spiritually disciplined people, number five, is they represent Christ wherever they go, especially in their home. They represent Christ wherever they go, especially in their home. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you'll receive power. Power to do what? Be a witness. That means you represent Christ wherever you go. It always hurts my heart when I see people do a bunch of stuff, and then at the end, oh, I was going to, but, but, but God forgive me. You knew what you were doing when you did it. You're not representing Christ. You're representing, but you're representing him bad. Amen? Especially in your home. <clears throat> you may talk about a, a lot about God and all that kind of stuff, but if nobody ever sees you pray, nobody ever sees you read your Bible, I'm not saying you do it to be seen. But if your children never see you doing this, in their mind, it's not real. If you're always lying, making promises to them, I'm going to take you to San Diego, to the zoo, uh, come December the 5th, uh, we're going to go to the zoo, and you don't take them. They don't forget that stuff. But you represent God everywhere you go especially in your home and especially in Walmart. <laughs> Represent Christ, amen. Yeah, pretty good. I said they can always see people in Walmart. They be hiding, trying to hide their basket. I'm not, I'm not, I don't care what you got in your basket. You ain't got to run from me. Say hi, preacher. I'm not even looking at that. The person you need to be hiding from is God. Amen. Now, I don't care what you got in your basket. That, that's you. Amen. Matthew chapter um, 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, I don't do it, so I don't want... Let your light shine before men. Well, I don't want nobody to know I'm a Christian. Let your light shine before men. But when they say happy holidays, I just say happy holidays back. I say no Merry Christmas. Because Christ is the reason for the season. Amen? We're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. I don't just say happy holidays. I say Merry Christmas because when you take Christ out of Christmas, what do you have? I'm talking about representing Christ. Everywhere you go. Especially in your home. I often say this, man, if you serve God and you got your job, I'm just talking about going to heaven and it's going to be a wonderful thing and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to tell you something. This is from my heart. Heaven won't be the same if my kids and my wife aren't there. And if I had some say so, if, if, if I, I had to go through the streets of gold and, and think about me, what I did, where I failed them. Because if you're a man and your family's not serving God, you're failing them somewhere. And I get it, people do what they want to do. But you tell me the last time somebody was able to resist prayer. You may be able to resist what I say, but you can't resist my prayer. You may be able to resist people, but you can't resist. When I get on my knees and I go before the Lord and I say I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray and I'm going to keep praying until God does something, how bad do you want it? How much are you willing to pray? How bad are you willing to fast for it? Let me tell you something. God honors those who keep their faith and trust in him. When you want something bad enough that you're willing to put down the food, that you're willing to put down the drink, and you say, God, I'm going to fast and pray until you do something. My kids are on drugs. How much are you praying? 
not go before God. And it's a sad thing when people raise their children and they don't teach them about the Lord. And they go in church and they play church. You know what I mean by playing church? When you come and you act like everything is good and you're really a devil. Or you, you, you in church doing the, trying to sleep with everybody. And it used to be a thing. And I, and I did it too. I wasn't saved. How many women in the church? How many did? I did it too. I'm not going to sit here and try to throw stones because I did it too. But the thing is, is that God saved me. So when Slick Willie come in here trying to walk all cool and stuff, I already know, I already know where you at, dog. I already, I already peeped you out before you even got through the door. I already saw you. I already know, I already know where your heart's at. But the thing is, God wants to save you. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. If you can't be a representative for your family, if you can't represent God, because I don't want to be. I've said this. When I got saved, I said, God, if I have children, let me represent you the right way. Let me live the right way. Because after a while, after you're serving God, it no longer be, it started being about you. It's about your relationship with him because other people are watching you. Because I don't want to be in hell looking through the flames of hell looking at my children. I don't want to be in hell glancing through the flames of hell and see my wife. Because God said I was the priest over my home. Because God said the man is the head. The man should be the spiritual leader. What happened in America? The women love God more than men. When you go to church, church is predominantly, predominantly occupied and, and, and there's women everywhere. Where are the men? There's something wrong. And the enemy knows that. If I can destroy the head. That's why when, you, when, when you're in charge of something, God wants, the, the, the enemy wants to attack you. That's why the leaders of this church, I pray for them constantly. Because I understand the attacks. I know that the devil is coming after you. I know it. Again, you can resist everything else, but you can't resist my prayers. Represent Christ, especially in your home. The last thing, I'm talking about um, conviction of the spiritually disciplined. They allow their confidence to be in God and not in themselves. A spiritually disciplined person allows their confidence to be in God, not in themselves. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image that you have set up. They allowed their confidence to be in God and not in themselves. And I like that scripture because they had made their minds up. No matter what happens, we're going to stand for God. And I like what they told Nebuchadnezzar. They said God's able to deliver us. But even if he don't, <laughs> he's going to deliver us from you. Whether it's through death or whether it's by his mighty hand, you're not going to be able to touch us. So as a child of God, you need to have that mentality. Yes, you may have haters, but your haters can't touch you because God has a hedge of protection around you. Amen? They may be able to say things. They may be able to try to undermine what they're doing. They may be trying to stick some monkey riches in what you're doing. They may try to flatten your ties, and they may be able to do all these different things. But there's one thing about God. When you stand on God's principles, when you stand on the hand of the Lord, he says that he's got the whole world in his hands. You and me, brother, he has us in his hands. When you stand on God, the devil cannot touch you. Amen. We have to keep our faith and our trust and our confidence in God. But the problem is that we start looking at what we can do. 
God, fix this problem. Let me, let me try to fix it. Either, you, either he's going to fix it or you're going to fix it. You know when people pray about things and say, I'm going to leave that in the hands of the Lord? A lot of times with relationships you have to do that. Because some people can be so jacked up that you have to just leave them in the hands of the Lord. But when you do that, stop going back trying to fix things. If you're going to leave it to the Lord, leave it to the Lord. Amen? Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through um, 13. Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at least you care for, your care for me has flourished again. Through you, sure, though, I'm sorry, through you. <laughs> though you surely did care for me, I'm listening to somebody else. <laughs> but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. For I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Now, people always want to use that scripture. But let me tell you something about that scripture. That's what Paul was saying. He said, I've learned how to be content. People aren't content nowadays. They always want more, always want greater. And there's nothing wrong with that. Amen? You should prosper. God wants you to be, but be content where you are. Amen? Your house is cool. At least you got a roof over your head. Amen? But God will bless you with another one if that's what you want. Amen? And if you're ready for it. Some people, God can bless them, and they head so big, they can't even get in church because they head so big. Amen? So we have to make sure that we have the right perspective. But Paul was saying that, he said say that about him. He said, I can do all things through Christ. Now, people always want to use that. I can do all things through Christ. Can you really? Or are you just quoting something somebody else said? It's got to be real in your life. Hey, man, I like what Mike Tyson said. He said, everyone has a plan. Until <laughs> they start getting hit. <laughs> That's true. People, people have a plan. Hey, we're going to get out there and make sure when he drabs his way, and you start just start biting the ear. Nah. <laughs> he said, everybody got a plan until you start getting hit. And that's the case. People can always say, I do what they're going to do. Man, if I was in your situation, I'd do this. Or if I was in your situation, I'd make sure this happened. If I was, have you ever been through something so egregious and so hard that it was so hard to pray? Have you ever been there and you were just trying to pray, but you kept thinking about that problem? You kept thinking about the situation. Yeah, it's easy to say that you do that, but how would you really act if you were really in that situation? I've had some things happen so egregious that, that I couldn't even get my mind focused to pray. Amen. Where it took me hours to just get my mind right so I could talk to God. Because I couldn't stop thinking about the problem. Amen. You have to allow your confidence to be in God. Amen. Do what you can do. Now I'm not saying don't do nothing. Because that's a problem too. When people just say, I'm just going to let God do it and, and I'm not going to do nothing. God, give me a job, but I'm going to sit here and watch uh, Maury all day long. He's not going to give you one because you're not doing nothing. God helps those who do what? Help themselves. Amen. It's not in scripture, but you already know. Amen. So don't, you can't just pray, God, I want turnips. Uh, Lord, let turnips come. I, I want turnips to grow, but you ain't bought no seed. You ain't got no plants. You ain't turned over no soil. You ain't watered nothing. Ain't no seeds coming. You do your best. And then you let God do the rest. God, I've committed the works into your hands. Do something with it. Amen. God, I've done this. I've done what the scripture said. That's why you have to learn how to pray that way. God, I've done what your word says. I've done everything I can do, but this person is still giving me problems at work. All of a sudden, you come in one day, and their desk will be empty. What happened to so-and-so? Oh, they got fired. Could they just... Now, it wasn't because of this other stuff. It was because they were messing with God's child. 
How do you feel about people when they mess with your children? Some big bully. Amen. I'm going to end with this. When I was a kid, that was a... That, I don't know. I'm not embarrassed. I'm just a child. But there was this girl that was... She was bigger than everybody. <laughs> when I was in like the third grade, man, and she used to bully me. She was a girl, but she was big. And, um, and, <laughs> and one time, um, my mom came to the school and they was, and I would tell her about this, but I didn't tell her she was a girl. <laughs> and she was like, that's a girl. I'm like, but she big though. She got it. <laughs> Amen. But I know if she could have done something, she would. Amen. <laughs> But that's the thing, as a child of God, you don't have to fight all the battles. Amen. And that's the problem. Sometimes we think that we have to fight all the battles. All you have to do is show up. That's what people don't get. You need to realize something. All the battle is not yours. That's what the scripture plainly says, Sister Robert. It says the battle doesn't belong to you, but the battle belongs to the Lord. If you learn how to internalize that, yes, all you got to do is show up. How about the Israelites? When God said, I don't want you to take no weapons, I don't want you to take no armor, the only thing I want you to do is to get the choir and to have the choir stand out there and sing. Here come the Malachites, here come the Philistines. With swords and spears, and they get ready to kill, and all of a sudden, people just start dying. That's God! Because God told them to do something. And they didn't lean on their own devices. They said, We're going to do what God said. He said, Don't take no weapons of war. I just want you to show up. I don't want the armor bearers out front. I want the choir out there. I don't want you singing the, the chants of war. I want you singing the hymns of Zion. That's the God we serve. Stop trying to fight your own battles. Let God fight for you. They allow their confidence to be in God and not in themselves. You can't do everything. You need to learn how to leave some things in the hands of the Lord. Now again, in this series that we're dealing with um, success in life or principles to live by, God wants you to be spiritually disciplined. Yes, sir. There's something about discipline that God honors. Prayer should not be a last resort. It should be the first option. You shouldn't go to church when there's some special event or when the wind blows or when I just feel religious. It should be a spiritual discipline. If you want the best from God, you need to give him your best. Amen. Amen. Learn how to be spiritually disciplined. Let's bow our heads and let's, let's, let's pray today. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, that you've given us the power to serve you. You've given us the ability to be disciplined. And we just pray, God, for every point that was brought out today that you would allow the saints, God, to exercise these things, to walk in that newness of life, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We just pray, God, that we can be your witnesses. Not only, God, in our community, but in our homes also. Let the world look at us and say, I want to be like that guy. Or I want to be like that sister. They're a true representative of Jesus Christ. God, I just pray for each one that's here that you strengthen us. We pray for those who are not here today, God. Bless them, God. Give them the strength and the courage, God, and the faith to attend your house once again. God, we just want to pray for those who don't know Jesus today, that you would open their heart, open their mind, open their soul, God, that they can receive your Son, Father, that died on the cross for our sins, that they can receive a gift, God. I mean, during this Christmas season, God, this holiday season, God, where, where people are giving gifts, God, the best gift you ever gave us was your Son who died on the cross for our sins. God, let people receive him today. Let their hearts be open, Lord. We know, Father, that your word tells us that you stand at the door and knock 
God, give them the power to open the door so you can come in. God, we thank you for discipline, God. We thank you for the disciplined life. We thank you for being disciples of your son. Once again, we praise you and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. So good.